Hi, this is Brian Keene, host of The Horror Show with Brian Keene here on Project I Radio. As you know, the Project I Radio network is growing in popularity, but with that popularity comes bigger expenses. Uh, now, I suggested that we have a yard sale. I thought maybe we could all go to Armand Rose Amelia's house and open up his garage and sell his furniture, probably without him or his wife knowing, but that idea got vetoed. So what we've done instead is we've started a patron campaign where you can directly support the network. Uh, you can become a patron at patron.com slash Project I Radio. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Project I Radio. Uh, if you'll become a patron, every dollar you pledge comes with exclusive rewards and goes towards helping the network grow. And it also goes towards me not breaking into Armand Rosamilia's house when he's not home and having a yard sale. So please, if you could, take a moment patron.com slash project i radio and thank you in advance for your support hey everybody it's dave uh before the show starts tonight i just want to issue a correction uh for something that brian says during the broadcast because as we all know there's a committee of broadcast excellence people out there that like to parse every single word that's said on our show and comment on it so uh, before we begin i just want to mention that it, during the proceedings tonight brian refers to sam brownback as a senator when in fact, Sam Brownback is the governor of Kansas. So we just want to change that and let you know that we know that Brian misspoke. And he, again, is the governor of Kansas, not a senator. And uh, for those of you keeping notes at home, Brian was sober when he recorded this. And I'm sober now because, you know, we supposedly constantly drink while we do our show. So uh, there you have it. And now on with tonight's broadcast. No comment. Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother <laughs> What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Project I Radio. I am your host, Brian Keen, flying solo today. Uh, Dave, Coop, and Dungeon Master 77.1 are all absent. Uh, Coop is, of course, driving around in his ambulance, saving lives and helping people and having adventures. And uh, Dungeon Master 77.1 is sound asleep, because I'm recording this late at night. And Dave, unfortunately is at home wading through a basement full of water. Uh, he and Phoebe had a pipe burst, and it flooded his basement, and they are currently dealing with that and uh, sending my thoughts out to them. Uh, hopefully the situation gets resolved soon. So you are stuck with me this week. However, through the miracle of time travel, both Dave and Dungeon Master 77.1 will be joining us later in the show. Uh, coming up, Christian Jensen returns to the show. Now, he first appeared way back in episode 18, and uh, it was one of our most popular early episodes. Uh, it's one that people still talk about and still listen to and laugh at. And uh, since that appearance, Christian has been one of our most requested return guests. So we're very happy to have him back on the show. Uh, we had interviewed him at an earlier date. Um, it's Dave and I and Christian and uh, Dungeon Master 77.1 makes an appearance halfway through the interview. And also Kelly Lehman uh, makes an appearance halfway through the interview. Uh, very unexpected, but very awesome. So we'll get to that. Uh, but before we do, I want to mention that uh, this week's show is sponsored by Nightscape Press and their new book, Darkling Incidents, Obscure Reflections, by K.M. Tonso. Tonso is spelled T-O-N-S-O. 
Uh, Darkling, in Darkling Incidents Obscure Reflections is available right now on Kindle and in trade paperback at all major book retailers. Herein are contained reflections of what, as St. Paul says, we see in a glass darkly. And as this angle of incidence is so shadowed, so must be the reflections it derives. These 16 stories provide obscure reflections of worlds much like ours, yet different. Worlds that grapple with increasingly confused and distorted realities. Each reflection so vivid as to become an open doorway where unwary readers might just find themselves stumbling over the threshold, never to return. Darkling Incidents, Obscure Reflections, is an elegant and dark mix of disturbing short stories written in exquisite and poetic prose. All editions include gorgeous cover and interior artwork by Luke Spooner of Carrion House. So we thank them. Once again, that is Nightscape Press and their new collection, Darkling Incidents, Obscure Reflections, by K.M. Tonso. This week's episode is also brought to you by Thunderstorm Books. Publishing the absolute finest signed limited edition hardcovers on the collectible market today. Uh, their current titles include Jonathan Jans's imprint. Uh, the Sorrows is uh, the first book in that imprint. It's out right now. Uh, House of Skin will be out this month as well. And Hobomock by Ryan C. Thomas, uh, one of my favorite new writers, in fact. Later in the summer, look for new releases from James Newman, Tim Curran, and Christopher Rufty. Um, if you are unfamiliar with what book collecting is all about, or what the signed limited edition hardcover market is all about, uh, then, then try a Thunderstorm book. Just try one at random, and you'll be so impressed with the craftsmanship and what goes into these. These are not just books. These are, these are fine art uh, to put on the shelf and to be handed down to generations to come. Visit them online at thunderstormbooks.com, and we thank both of them for sponsoring this week's show. Um, as we'll do before we get to our interview with Christian, we'll go over the news. Um, before we do that, uh, I want to thank the folks who came to Du Bois, Pennsylvania last week, uh, for our signing there. Um, you know, it's funny. We signed in Du Bois Friday night and Saturday. It was myself and, uh, Megan Hart and Mary San Giovanni and Stephen Kozanowski and, and all kinds of other folks, um, <laughs> And it's, it's funny, I had, a, we had a lot of people show up, but for myself personally, I, there weren't many locals. Um, I had uh, Aaron, who drove down from Rochester, New York, to Du Bois, Pennsylvania. I had Kenny, uh, who drove all the way from Michigan to Du Bois, Pennsylvania. I had Kim who flew from Bermuda. Uh, now, now I ask her, I say, where did you come from? And she says, uh, she says Bermuda. And I'm assuming there must be some small town named Bermuda, Pennsylvania. So I say, oh, uh, how, how far is that? And she says, oh, it's about 812 miles. It's off the coast of Florida. She came from Bermuda. Apparently her sister or her sister-in-law lived in the next town over. And, uh, she saw that I was going to be signing in Du Bois and thought it would be a good opportunity to visit family and bring her books along and get them signed. Um, so thanks to all of them for coming out. That that meant a lot. Um, <laughs> it was really neat. I, and I guess I did sign some books for some locals. Um, I, I got to meet Ron Davis, uh, who I guess is semi-local. I guess he's about two hours away. Um, he's been a a reader for years, and I recognized his name from social media and the, the message board, etc., but I'd never got to meet him in person, so that was awesome. Um, Sunday, Mary and Stephen and myself decided to have a little experiment. Um, you know how entertainers like Kanye West are always hopping on social media and saying, you know, I'll perform a free concert at X location at midnight tonight, be there. Well, we decided uh, what we would do is we'd tweet out a location in Youngstown, Ohio, which was about an hour and a half from Du Bois, and uh, we'd show up there and see if anybody else would show up as well. So we picked the parking lot of a Quaker Steak and Lube. Now, for those of you who aren't in the region, Quaker Steak and Lube, it's a play on the old Quaker State 
uh, garages, you know, where you can get your car worked on, your oil changed, etc. Um, it's basically a wings joint. They serve steaks and sandwiches and, and lots of wings. So we picked the parking lot, tweeted out the address and the time, and I figured maybe two or three people would show up. Um, so we had, I'm counting in my head here, myself, Oh, see, I, I don't have Dave here to stall for me, so I'd have to count out loud. But I, I guess we had, in total, uh, just about a dozen people. Um, they came in waves. Uh, there was an early group that arrived. And um, this one dude, Jason, man, he, he brought uh, every book from home um, and brought his, his young daughter along. And, and it, it was so awesome to sign his books and to, to have a moment with him and talk to his daughter. And, um I signed a copy of Pressure for her. I don't think she's old enough to read it yet. But um, he had to leave. But uh, Travis and and some of the other fans that were there, uh, we invited them to go into Quaker Steak with us. And then while we were in there eating, a second wave of people showed up. Uh, so I, I got out and spent some time with them, went out of the restaurant and signed all their books that they had brought along. And... Uh, you know, took some pictures, and as they were leaving, uh, another car pulled up looking for me. So it was, it was. I consider it a success. You know, look, a dozen people. You know, maybe some of you are out there saying you drove an hour and a half to sign books for a dozen people. Was that really worth it? Well, yeah, it was worth it. It was absolutely worth it. Um, you know, these are people that have been reading my books for a long time, and. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity to meet them and, and put a face to the name and, you know, see what they're about, hear their stories, and, and just learn a little bit more about them. Um, as I told Dungeon Master 77.1, these are the people that pay for our groceries, they pay for the roof over our heads, and yeah, to be able to give back to them a little bit like that, it was absolutely fucking worth it. So, thanks to all those folks who showed up. Uh, next week, I will be in California and Arizona and New Mexico. Um, that's actually over the next two weeks. We'll talk more about those dates next week, though. Um, I also want to mention before we get to the news that uh, Rec Level 3, which is a show here on Project I Radio, uh, they've relaunched and retooled their podcast. Um, if you have a free moment this week, a free hour, uh, maybe when you're done listening to this podcast, tune them in and listen to their latest episode and let them know what you think. Give them some feedback on this relaunch. Uh, that is Rec Level 3. All right, so the news. It's no secret that my favorite film is John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, I am very excited about this, and you should be too. Uh, Shout Factory will be releasing a brand new Blu-ray edition on September 20th. Um, they've announced a number of new special features that will be added to the two-disc set. First of all, the film will be presented using a new 2K scan of the Interpositive and a new 4.1 sound mix from the original 70mm 6-track Dolby Stereo soundtrack. I don't know what any of that means, but it sounds impressive. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, one of you out there knows what it means. You can explain it to me. Hit us up on uh, the the show's Facebook page and, and let us know what the hell that means. Um, other new features uh, include interviews with the men of Outpost 31, Keith David, Thomas Waits, Peter Maloney, uh, an interview with editor Todd Ramsey, visual effects artist Peter Curran and Susan Turner, uh, special makeup effects artists Rob Berman and Brian Wade, uh, an interview with supervising sound editor David Lewis Udall, special sound effects designer Alan Howarth, and other members of the crew. Now, if you have the old DVD release, um, this new Blu-ray set will also include the John Carpenter, Kurt Russell commentary track and other special, special features from those earlier releases. Uh, that commentary track is one of my favorites. I don't often listen to those, but... As I said, The Thing is, is my favorite film of all time, and, and I've listened to every extra on that DVD time and time again. Um, this new Blu-ray edition from Shout Factory will also come 
with the 92-minute U.S. broadcast version of the thing. Now, that's the version that they edited it down to be shown on television, on network television. So all of the gorier effects have been removed. Um, now, you may say, well, why watch the thing with the gore removed? Well, because... You should do so be, because you'll realize that the movie is still scary. It's still moody and atmospheric and funny, even without all that stuff in it. Um, it really is remarkable filmmaking that has stood the test of time. So uh, check that out. Again, that comes out September 20th, two days before my birthday. Um, I know Mary is listening and Kelly Owen and, and all our other friends. Um, you know, That's two days before my birthday. So if each of you wants to get me a copy of that, that would be awesome. In other news, M. Night Shyamalan, now we've talked about him a lot on the show, um, this week it was announced he is rebooting Tales from the Crypt for TNT and the TBS networks. It's slated to premiere next year. Um, TNT and TBS have partnered with Wattpad. Now if you don't know what Wattpad is, it's an online community. Uh, where users share original stories. Basically, you know, if you want to... It's a place where you can blog or you can write fan fiction, things like that. Um, it's not something I use myself, but I am familiar with it. Um, anyway, TNT and TBS have partnered with Wattpad for the project. Uh, they say that Wattpad's 45 million users will have the opportunity to have their stories adapted for the networks, for TV, digital, and or mobile platforms. Now that gave me pause when I read it, and I'll explain why, but but first let's, let's read a little bit from the press release. Um, it says that TNT, TBS, and Wattpad will invite writers to bring their story ideas forward through contests and other opportunities. Under the deal, the networks will also tap into Wattpad's data-driven models to help identify new talent and ideas from Wattpad users. Justin Williams, the Senior Vice President uh, of Digital Ventures for TNT and TBS said, quote, our partnership with Wattpad is a perfect intersection of content and fan engagement, where fans actually have the chance to directly influence and, in some cases, even have their material optioned and developed by our networks. Aaron Levitz, the head of Wattpad Studios, said, quote, There are many ways we can help the entertainment industry zero in on new voices and stories with massive built-in fan bases. Through our partnership with Turner, Wattpad's powerful insights, roster of influential writers, and hyper-engaged community of fans will help define the new scary. The eagerly anticipated Tales from the Crypt horror block marks the future of television, where leading networks source content from fans and build programming together with the audience. Um, you know, my first thing about this is, <clears throat> okay, you, you're a fan, writing on Wattpad, uh, submitting for Tales from the Crypt. That all sounds great, but are you getting WGA, WGA minimums? Uh, WGA is, of course, the Writers Guild. Uh, they are the union for folks who write for television and for film, and they have minimums that must be upheld. Uh, is this a way around that? Uh, what kind of a rights grab are the networks going to make? Uh, who will you negotiate with? You know, if, if you're a fan doing this, you, you're going to go out and get an agent. I don't. I don't know. This. I know that. I know that this is where the industry is going. Okay, we see it happening in comics. We see it happening, especially with Marvel and DC. Um, it surprises me that it's happening this fast with television. Um, and if it's happening this fast with television, then that tells me it's it's going to start happening with film. And uh, it's scary new ground. It's no man's land. It's all being tested right now. And, and while that might be exciting, it also really opens people up to be victimized and taken advantage of. So uh, we'll keep an eye on this. But you know what? Um, can't say anything bad about it, certainly. But if you are one of those writers that that want to submit to Tales from the Crypt, I, I would proceed with caution, okay? In other news, The Sixth Gun, published by Oni Press, ends this week 
with the triple sized issue number 50 which is on sale now wherever comic books are sold uh, the Six Gun is, of course, a weird Western horror comic book series written by Colin Bunn, uh, Brian Hurt, and Bill Crabtree. Now, that launched back in 2010. It's now 2016, so six years later. Um, what's important about this, not just that Colin is a friend of the show, but from a comic book industry perspective, few creator-owned series last 50 issues, okay? It's just, that's... That's not the norm. Uh, I mean, we could look at Preacher or some things like that, but they weren't truly creator-owned. They were owned by DC. The, the creators just got a, a share of the profits from them. Um, you know, in looking at true creator-owned stuff, we have to look at Oni, and we have to look at Image and Anarch Press, uh, you know, places like that. And you just you don't see many series reaching 50 issues. Um, you know, the, the writers and the artists, they, they usually do not get a chance to finish telling the story they want to tell. Um, I can speak from personal experience on that. The Last Zombie, my comic book series for Antarctic Press, um, which when people ask me, you know, what do you think one of the best things you ever wrote is? I, I never say The Last Zombie simply because most people don't read comic books. Most people... You know, more people read my prose than have ever read any of my comics. But I do think The Last Zombie is one of the best things I've ever written. Um, it's a different medium. It will not appeal to all of my audience. I know that. But, you know, I, I do think it is one of the best things I've ever written. Um, it ties into my overall mythos. You know, the character Frankie makes an appearance halfway through the series. Um, one of the characters from The Last Zombie will make an appearance later on in something I'm working on. So, you know, it is a part of my mythos. Um, now, it did well, especially for Anarchic Press. Uh, they were very happy with it. I was happy with it. Uh, I had originally pitched it as running for 50 issues. Of course, we never made it to that. Um, we only made it to 25 before... Uh, sales, you know, demanded that, that we end it. And it's not that it wasn't selling well. It's just that by that point, people had begun waiting for the trade paperback collections. Um, so, yeah, we had to end that at issue 25, um, which I've always regretted because there were a lot of things I wanted to do with that story, a lot of things I had mapped out that I just never got a chance to get to. Um, so, yeah, for the six-gun to reach 50 issues, that is a fucking huge success. Um, congrats to all those guys, especially Colin. I've known Colin since, oh God, 1999 maybe, 1998. Um, he's just, he's genuinely one of the good guys, especially when you look at the people in this business. He really is one of the good guys. Um, you know, we've always laughed. Colin... He wanted to be a novelist, and I wanted to be a comic book writer. And somewhere along the way, we switched careers. Um, and, you know, I, I know comics is, is not a happy place to work right now. But, you know, i got to tell you, book publishing is not a happy place to work right now either. But, you know, I am always, always proud of Cullen. Um, anytime I see his name in, in the comics news, which is, is quite often these days, and... Uh, you know, not to detract from the work he does for Marvel or the work he does for DC or others, but, you know, this, the Six Gun, this this was his own vision, um, and he got to tell it the way he wanted to tell it. And uh, kudos to him. Dude, I, if you're listening, I'm proud of you. Congratulations. And uh, now I want to see you do some sword and sorcery, okay? <laughs> All right. Before we get to this next story, Brian needs a drink. Now, as you know, we do not hit the pause button. Um, usually that's okay when there's someone else here in the studio, but it's just me solo. So there is going to be a moment of silence while I have a drink. If you're drinking at home, you're welcome to join me. All right. Our big news story for the week. And uh, when we get into this, you'll understand why I needed a drink. We're going to talk about Robin Wyatt Dunn. And I want to spell his name for you because it is a name 
you're going to want to check your social media friends list for. Uh, Robin, R-O-B-I-N, Wyatt, W-Y-A-T-T, Dunn, D-U-N-N. Why are we talking about Mr. Dunn? Well, last week, he made a very clear and graphic death threat against editor Ellen Datlow. Uh, now, even though Mercedes Yardley and Patrick Freevold and Craig Spector say that this show should not be reporting on things like this, and that I should have compassion for the perpetrators, and that I'm a bully for reporting on people like this. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and report on it anyway, because Robin Dunn is not some random weirdo on the internet. I mean, he is a weirdo on the internet, but he's not some random guy. Okay, this is a very accomplished writer and editor. Um, he's published a number of books, including several with Crisis Chronicles Press, he is the editor of a zine called the Los Angeles Review of Los Angeles. Uh, and with that zine, he has published many new and aspiring authors. He was formerly a member of the HWA uh, just for a short while before they revoked his membership in the organization. And we'll get to why in a moment. Um, he claims he's done a reading and a signing at Mysterious Galaxy in San Diego. I was not able to confirm that, but it's possible. Uh, he claims to be employed intermittently as a professor at several California universities and colleges. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to confirm that either. Oh, hey, guess who forgot to mute his phone? And let's see who's texting. We won't embarrass them on the air. Um... It's Casey Lansdale and Skip Novak. So hello to both of them. We're going to mute the phone now. I'll text them back later. Um, Mr. Dunn was also, until this week, Facebook friends with a vast number of genre authors, editors, and fans, many of whom have now blocked him, but others of whom are not aware of him, are not aware of the allegations against him, um, and who may want to become aware of those things. Uh, so, I mentioned he was kicked out of the HWA. Yes, the Horror Writers Association board kicked him out of the organization after, are you ready for this? He made death threats against Senator Sam Brownback. He made death threats against a U.S. senator. Um, and the HWA board kicked him out. Okay, now, he does not blame HWA. Uh, Mr. Dunn doesn't even blame the whole board. No. He only blames the two female members on the board, President Lisa Morton and Ellen Datlow. Datlow. No male members have earned his ire, and I think that needs to be underlined and highlighted because I'm going to establish a pattern here. Anyway, last week, Dunn wrote in a blog post titled Death to Ellen Datlow, he writes, and I'm just going to quote, I know it sounds mean, doesn't it? Well, I'm a mean person, but not as mean as Ellen Datlow. I know you're saying, Robin, you're a writer. Your job is to take it in the ass from whatever rich person is pitching this year. I know I'm not a very good writer in that way. Death to Ellen Datlow, but more importantly, death to everything she represents, which is old New York, of course, but more too, the ancient legacy of the nobility. You've heard it said that man will be free only when the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. Priest, you know what that's about, don't you? I know you do. But of course, to get to the king and his high priests, we'll have to work our way up. Do I really want to stick her pointy little head into the guillotine and then burn her corpse in the middle of Park Avenue? Well, of course I do, and America would be a better place if I did that. He goes on to say, I do believe that she should die along with everything she represents. End quote. Now, you know, given our experience a few months ago, reporting on accusations and allegations of rape 
and facts and allegations and reporting facts as facts and allegations as allegations and all that nonsense. Long-time listeners will remember it, okay? I'm hesitant to do stories like this anymore. Um, I shouldn't say I'm hesitant. I should say I hesitate every time, okay? Because, because what reporting on those sexual abuse stories taught me was that there are self-serving motherfuckers out there who will use it for their own means and their own ends, whether it's to get notoriety for themselves or whether it's to take a shot at me. Um, and I'm sure there will be some people this week who will take me to task for reporting on this story. Uh, in advance, I'd like to invite those people to kiss my ass, okay? And I can probably already predict what they're going to say. They're going to say, well, he was making a political statement. Well, that's fine and dandy. Uh, you know, my Facebook feed right now is full of political statements. I've got friends who are progressives. I've got friends who are conservatives. I'm seeing all sorts of political statements from them. Um, but I'm not seeing my leftist friends call for Donald Trump to be beheaded. And I'm not seeing my, my uh, friends on the right calling for Hillary Clinton to be beheaded. Okay. Um, you know, what, what this sounds like is, uh, perhaps a leftist or a progressive who needs to be on medication and has perhaps listened to InfoWars or Alex Jones, uh, one too many times. Um, I mean, this, this is just, this is fucking sick. Okay. Strangling with the entrails, you know, stick her pointy little head into the guillotine and then burn her corpse in the middle of Park and Avenue. I do believe that she should die. Okay, this is not a political statement. Okay, these are the ramblings of a very sick mind. Um, it's also important to note that Ellen is not the first woman that Mr. Dunn has threatened or done this to. No, not at all. Back in 2013, book reviewer Carrie Slegger was threatened by him as well. She writes, and I quote, I received an email via my contact page from an author named Robin Wyatt Dunn. It was a review request, which, as you guys know, I'm currently not accepting from authors. So, as per my usual policy, I sent him links to my review policy as well as my article, How to Alienate Book Reviewers. I said this is not necessarily a pol I said this in not necessarily a polite fashion, but more of a brisk one that wasn't rude. Specifically, I said here, link, and here, link, for my answer. Now, I want I want to pause her quote right there, okay? Uh, some readers, some listeners who are not authors or not in the business right now, they might be saying, well, that seems kind of rude. Well, no, it's not. Um... On average, I, I get 200 emails a day. I've posted screenshots of this before on social media because people didn't believe me. 200 emails a day. If I spent all day answering those emails, I would never get anything written. I would never have time to play with Dungeon Master 77.1. Um, it, is, it is absolutely physically impossible that I will ever answer all those emails. The ones I do answer, I am brisk. Um, eight times out of ten, I would say the email is something that could be answered as easily as clicking the frequently asked questions page on briankeen.com. And what I'll do is link to that page. Here you go. Here's the information. Uh, so, no, I, I don't think Carrie is being rude here. I think she's being busy and she's, she's you know, organizing her time to the best of her ability. Uh, anyway, let's let's get back to, to what she wrote here. Again, quote, If Dunn was like most authors, he would have just given up and left it at that. I have never gotten a reply to my links before. Most authors accept that I am not accepting book reviews, that they screwed up by submitting to me, and move on. But not Dunn, oh no. I had emailed him back promptly at 2.16 p.m. because I happened to be home at that time. Five minutes later... I checked my email again to find this reply. Now, this is the reply from Robin Dunn. He wrote, Here for my answer to your answer. And then he links to a thread on the IGN.com message boards called What's a Cheap, Quick, and Painless Way to Kill Yourself. 
Again, what's a cheap, quick, and painless way to kill yourself? Carrie goes on to say, I'll be honest with you guys here. I started to tremble, not with fear, but with a mixture of rage and disgust. There is never, under any circumstances, an excuse to suggest someone kill themselves. Suggesting someone kill herself because you didn't follow their clearly stated policy in a place where you should have looked before contacting her is particularly unacceptable. It's akin to chastising a child for reaching into the cookie jar only to have that child hit you and scream, I hate you, at the top of their lungs. End quote. So, as I said... Ellen is not the first person he's done this to, uh, and I should stress, not the first female he's done this to. Now, Dave and I, in researching this story in the past week, have uncovered allegations that there may be a third and fourth woman who he has also threatened with death. Um, we did track down who we think the third woman is. Uh, she was unwilling to go on the record with us. Uh, we have not tracked down the identity of the fourth person. Uh, so, women number three and four, those are allegations at this time. Okay? Ellen Datlow and uh, Carrie Slagger, those are not allegations. Those are facts. Those are facts. Screenshots exist. They are all over the internet. If you do not know how to use Google, ask us on the Horror Show Facebook page, and we will happily post them and supply them. Um, however, threatening women with death is not the only thing that Robin Wyatt Dunn stands accused of. Uh, also, another fact, okay, not an allegation, but a fact. He sent an absolute torrent of documented, vile, anti-Semitic messages to scientist, author, and editor John Skylar. Uh, John has all of those documented on his website. Again, Google and you will find them. And if you can't find them, we will be happy to provide a link. Um, Mr. Dunn has also publicly stated that he will not buy stories from Israelis for the magazine that he edits. Again, that magazine is the Los Angeles Review of Los Angeles. So, that's Robin Wyatt Dunn in a nutshell. Now, I would like to point out to Mercedes Yardley, Craig Spector, Patrick Freevold, and the rest of that group that Dave and I did, in fact, reach out to Robin Wyatt Dunn for comment. I sent him the following. Hi, Robin. Working on a news story regarding the perceived death threat you made against Ellen Datlow on your blog earlier this week. A similarly, similarly perceived threat you made against a female reviewer last year and rumors of a third similar situation. If you'd like to respond to any of these allegations or clarify what you wrote, of which screenshots have been provided to us, Please email the horror show with Brian Keene at Outlook.com no later than Tuesday, 8 a.m. EST. Thank you. End quote. So there you go, kids. I, I reached out to him, okay? Well, Mr. Dunn responded. Uh, his response was, quote, sure, read it again, end quote, and then he linked to his death screed about Ellen Datlow, death to Ellen Datlow. Um, apparently he decided that that wasn't enough. He then sent us a second email, uh, with the subject line, additional comment. It read, quote, for my safety and the safety of my family, I will say this once. I threaten no one with death. I, along with millions of others, de desire the destruction of the ruling class on this earth. That is our aim. For my part in this revolution, we will wield no guillotines, and we will reach out to all our fellow beings for assistance in this revolution, rich and poor. We are building a democracy, and it has no room for these extremes of wealth, power, and control. End quote. So, uh, even though he, he wrote that he wants to kill Ellen Datlow with a guillotine, he now says that, that uh, he won't actually do that, and that um, he's leading a revolution against rich people by asking other rich people to participate. I, I don't know. Um, look, obviously this man is unwell. And I'm not going to sit here and make fun of, of 
somebody who's suffering from mental health problems. Um, I don't think it can be stated enough that he needs help. Uh, he, he definitely needs help. Um, this is scary. This is scary for all involved. Um, but, you know, what can you do about it? Well, you know, you can, first of all, if you're a new author starting out, maybe consider not submitting to the Los Angeles Review of Los Angeles. Um, but more importantly, check your, check your Facebook page. Now, he's not active on Twitter. Apparently, his Twitter account was shut down. Twitter shut it down due to harassment. Um, but he is very active on Facebook. Um, all week long, I've been seeing reports and, from people saying that, you know, he was, he was spamming them with private messages that were uncomfortable, that were threatening, or uh, that were bizarre and, and political and, and didn't seem to make sense. Um, as I said at the beginning, the, the number of authors and editors and artists and fans and readers uh, that this man is friends with on Facebook is staggering. Um, I don't get the sense that most of these people actually know him. I think it's more of a case of, you know, oh, look, uh, th this person wants to follow me. I'll, I'll follow them back and be their friend and maybe sell them a book. Um, it would behoove you to take a moment on Facebook tonight and check your friends list and type in Robin Wyatt Dunn, D-U-N-N, and see if he's your friend. And if so, you know, maybe consider unfriending him, maybe consider blocking him as, uh, many have done. Um, bottom line, Mr. Dunn, if you're listening, you know, what you did is unacceptable. Um, what you said to Alan Datlow and about Alan Datlow was unacceptable. What you said to Carrie was unacceptable. Uh, what you said to these other two women, if in fact those allegations are true, is unacceptable. Um, get help. That's all I can say to you. Um, that's all I got to say. You know, you, fuck it. I'm going to get hollered at either way. So uh, I'm just going to keep on doing what I do here, folks. Um, I'm going to continue to shine a light on things like this because nobody else is. And uh, I got big shoulders. I can take it. So, you know, say what you will. Um, before we get to our interview with Christian Jensen, as we have been every week, I want to remind you about the Scares the Care charity event being held July 22nd through the 24th in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, you can meet Skinner and Cigarette Smoking Man from the X-Files. You can meet Danny from The Shining, Joe R. Lansdale, Brian Smith, Mary San Giovanni, myself, and many more. You can even meet Dave there. Um, every week we've been spotlighting somebody different that will be in attendance. This week I want to spotlight Weston Oaks, Yvonne Navarro, and Cemetery Dance's Richard Chismar. Okay, first of all, Weston and Vaughn, this will be their only East Coast appearance all year long, okay? This is it. They're doing one East Coast appearance in 2016, and it scares the care. And next year, with any luck, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who is uh, currently uh, working on SEAL Team 666, an adaptation of... Uh, Weston's novel, they're, they're turning it into a film, that will probably be out next year, and we'll never get Weston to come to any signings or conventions ever again, because he'll be way too big for any of us. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Weston and Vaughn alone, that that's huge, okay? But then we've got Richard Chismar from Cemetery Dance. Now, Rich never does appearances. He's done, like, one con. He did an econ back in, I don't know, like, 2007, 2008? He never does public appearances. He, he rarely does signings, okay? The number of people that have met him, you can, you can probably count them on two hands, all right? So this is a, this is a huge opportunity. It, it's a rare opportunity to not only meet Rich, meet Rich Chismar, but, you know, to get your book signed by him and to talk to him about Cemetery Dance, talk to him about, you know, his friendship with Stephen King. Just, I mean, he's a fascinating guy to talk to. Um, and he will be there all weekend. Weston and Yvonne will be there all weekend. And so will all kinds of other folks. Um, for all the details on the convention, you can go to scaresthecareweekend.com. I do want to remind you the hotel is sold out, but 
It is Williamsburg, Virginia. It is a huge tourist town, and there are other hotels nearby within walking distance, and all of them have rooms available. Okay, so we'll see you there. One more time, thanks to Nightscape Press and their new book, Darkling Incidents, Obscure Reflections by K.M. Tonso. Uh, that is available right now on Kindle, on Amazon, and in trade paperback at all major book retailers. Darkling Incidents, Obscure Reflections is an elegant and dark mix of disturbing short stories written in exquisite and poetic prose. All editions include gorgeous cover and interior artwork by Luke Spooner of Carrion House. This week's show is also brought to you by Thunderstorm Books, publishing the absolute finest signed limited edition hardcovers in the collectible market today. Uh, you can learn more about them at thunderstormbooks.com. All right, now we'll go to the interview with Christian Jensen. Um, as I said, Kelly Lehman makes a surprise appearance. Dungeon Master 77.1 makes a time, uh, surprise appearance, and things just go off the rails. And uh, then we'll be back to finish up the show. Okay, Dave, joining us now is author Christian Jensen. Uh, Christian first appeared on the show way back in episode 18, as you remember, during which he and Coop successfully launched a goat into space. <laughs> Still one of the greatest episodes in the history of podcasting. <laughs> the author of over 40 horror and erotica titles, his books include Lone Survivor, Witch's House, Paranormal Reality, Amy Obeys, Amy Obeys 2, which I'm guessing is a sequel to Amy Obeys, uh, <laughs> Zombies, The Beginning of the End, and dozens more. Uh, Christian, it should be noted, your last appearance in addition to the GOAT launch, uh, you and Coop set the record for the most usage of the F word in a single episode. If I remember correctly, Dave, it was 147 fucks. That's, that sounds about That's right. That's tallied yeah. by Phoebe. Yes. One um, of the highlights of my life up to this point. <laughs> yeah, will, will you break that today? I don't think I will. No? That I, I have a problem. I, I'm sober. Well, we can fix that, except you need to drive home today. Yeah. I do need to drive home today, and uh, oh, my microphone's flopping. That, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to tell you um, here. I mean, I can fucking try. Okay, well, there's I, one. I will, fucking, I will fucking give him my best fucking shot oh, yeah. to say fuck as many fucking times I fucking can. That was, what, seven, eight? Something like that. Now, yeah. unfortunately, Phoebe's not here. Yeah. Dungeon Master 77.1 is on summer vacation. I could call him in, and he yeah. could keep count. <laughs> But I don't think that's a very good idea. That's probably it's bad. Slightly yeah. inappropriate, oh, yeah. maybe. <laughs> For those at home, he just <laughs> shouted in, I heard that. So, you watch TV. You don't listen to what's going on in here right now. It's, it's best you don't know. <laughs> All right. So, welcome back to the show, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank good, you. Oh, good to have oh you. thank you. Thank you. Thank good you. to have you here. So nice to be here. You good on coffee? I am very good on All coffee right. right now, yes. Um, I just want to apologize. I may have to. To stop halfway through and go make him dessert. He's eating lunch right now. Oh, that's that's or, fine. Dessert comes before you know, or help him find a toy. So, <laughs> but we'll 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 struggle through. So, uh, let's start off. Since your last visit, okay, now you were doing really well. Your last visit. Since then, uh, a number of your books have been banned by Amazon.com. Yeah, it happens. What the hell happened? Um. There, there's there's really no explanation for it. Amazon does that from time to time. Uh, either somebody gets a bug up their ass, a fucking bug up their ass, excuse me, <laughs> and uh, they complain about something. Either it's the title or the cover or the, the subject matter, which I, I don't understand when you have a disclaimer, warning, graphic adult content. This is a book of erotica with strong sexual themes and innuendos. And, and you had that in the book oh, description. Oh, every single book description I have has that. And I, I specifically state what kind of sexual situations I have on the book, whether it's straight sex, gay sex, lesbian sex, uh, transgendered sex, uh, llamas, horses, sheep, cattle, Bigfoot, what, whatever whatever sex is, is there. Is there a big market for llama erotica? Um, not a huge market. I, <laughs> <laughs> the only one I know that's actually into it, uh, no, I don't know anybody who's into it. <laughs> so, so you've got that disclaimer and everything. Now, was it mostly your erotica works, or did only. they ban some of your? No, it was only your only erotica. Okay, yeah. yeah, only erotica. How does that work? Do they just mass ban it all, or was it one at a time? No, it's it's either two or three titles one at a time. But usually, when one goes, I know a couple others are going to start going as well. Really? And uh, it, it's happened to me a couple different times throughout my career, and. Uh, it hadn't happened in a long time, so I was actually really surprised because I haven't touched any of these titles. I haven't even self-published anything in 
oh, shit, a year, year and a half. Right. And I thought they would just leave me alone. And uh, all of a sudden, I get a notification that this book got banned, and this book got banned, and this book got banned. And then it's it's always uh, pending our review of Amazon's uh, policies and procedures, and you know our, our moral rights to uh, you know impose upon you and what you write. And uh, they do that all the time. Barnes and Noble, they don't care. I love Barnes and Noble. Right. I will take Barnes and Noble, especially the, the self publishing end for their Nook, any day of the week over the the Amazon stuff. Yeah. They. They have never once banned anything that I put up, and they probably should have, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I banned some of my stuff, but but that, I've never had a problem with them. Um, Amazon, I don't know if they uh, they just kind of give in when somebody complains or if they just uh, they start looking and they have somebody who's, who's bored that sits around and goes through manuscript after manuscript and, you know. So it is what it is. And sometimes some of them will come back. Sometimes they won't, you know. Do you ever wonder if it's other writers? Uh, I know for a fact, at least on two occasions, it has been. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know why. Um, I, I don't know why anybody would actually be jealous of, of me <laughs> with all my fame and fortune and notoriety. <laughs> it, you'd, that You'd be surprised because a lot of these people are delusional and think that if if they had no competition, they'd be billionaires. And well, if you yeah. if you look at the the, the Amazon list, and mm-hmm. even if you just put in erotica of any sort, I mean, there you can't count the titles. There, oh yeah, there's you tons. Can't yeah. Count the titles. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I started self publishing, and I would put a, a buck or two up, and I would get maybe one two sales, just enough to actually see the chart appear on there. I was doing bad if i was in the 400 thousands you know like mm-hmm. oh your, your book is four hundred and seven thousand. be like oh man i'm like dead last in this category now it's somewhere in the nine or ten million <laughs> and it you you look at at the number of of titles that are out there and it's it's absurd so you know why why they get to me when they get to me right you know do they give you any recourse? Is there like somebody you can email or call and make a case for yourself? Well, the initial email is a form. You do not respond to this email. Email, and right. then you can go in through Amazon and find someone to to cry to. I've tried that two or three times, and I've never even gotten a response. Yeah. So I figure, you know what? I'm not going to bother with it. I can always backdoor in by changing the cover, changing the title, changing something, and then I, I just put a disclaimer in this is how ridiculous it is. I had I had one book changed um, too taboo too wrong um, there was uh, incest <laughs> there was um, just all kinds of hor- horrific sex right. stuff and um, well, there's a big market for that there, we're not there judging is. here no oh, okay well, well, JF Gonzalez did uh, incest erotica yeah it's, under a pseudonym you know? I mean I've, I've touched pretty much all the erotica you can at some point sometimes literally because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pervert, but the the stuff that I see that sells, I'll keep I'll keep writing. And and too taboo, too wrong was it first got kicked off because they said the cover didn't meet the there's the acceptable standards. Okay. So I changed the cover, and then a couple weeks later got kicked off because it said that in the description I explained the forbidden words, with one of them being incest. Okay. So I changed the description around. But I wasn't going to be untruthful and not say what it was. So I just I took the word incest out and just put um, graphic depictions of a brother and sister having intercourse. And that passed their, their standards perfectly fine. Really? And that stayed out for about three months. And then I got a, a, a complaint from a, a reviewer that the book didn't meet their standards. And then they pulled the book out and threatened that if I was to try to put it back up again. Cause I, get, I don't know if they saw but they said if I try to put the book back up, that all my books would be taken off of Amazon. I know they've got an algorithm that tracks how many times you yeah. put a book back up. Yeah. So how many total have been banned? From Amazon, well, I would say probably about 12 or 15 over time. But of those, probably five five to seven have come back maybe. Yeah. Um, but a couple of them have been banned more than once. Right. So you don't want to push it. So I, I don't put... Now, the Too Taboo, Too Wrong is the only one that I ever republished. Yeah. Try to, like, sneak it back in. Because that was actually the first one that ever got banned for me. This was back 
for five, six years ago, I think. Oh, really? Um, okay. When I started self-publishing, yeah, probably, well, maybe a little bit less, four or five years ago, I guess. But um, after I put that in, I got that letter that, that pretty much said, you know, we're just taking everything you have off. If you put this book back up, I'm like, all right, forget it then. You don't let it stay off. And then I kind of expected Barnes & Noble to come off, but I noticed that my sales spiked at Barnes & Noble. Right. <laughs> so I figured, all right, well, you know what, let Amazon, because I make more money on, for my erotica off of Barnes & Noble at least double than I do off Amazon. See, that was my next question for you because in the minds of most readers, Kindle is the go-to. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I wondered if it had impacted your income at all. Um, I don't think so. My The erotica sales, I mean, everything's really slow with, with the, my self-published stuff because I haven't pushed any of it. I haven't really discussed it, brought it up. Right. I don't market it on Facebook anymore. Um, I was focusing more on the... My, my the works with my publisher that right. no longer your hard stuff yeah <laughs> right and uh, now that I'm without a publisher and I'm thinking about either I'm trying to weigh my options going back into self publishing or do part self publishing do small some small press or, or what what you know whatever I'm going to do um, it's a matter of where am I going to make the most money right and the the way. The erotic is completely different, though. It's, I mean, we might as well be talking about a completely different career from from the horror stuff. Yeah. Horror stuff sells way better on Amazon. Yeah. I think if you're mainstream, if you're reading something, and I mean, horror is not even that mainstream, but, you know, the, the stuff that you can tell people what you're reading. Right. That's on Amazon. The stuff that you don't want mom and dad and grandma and Jesus to know you read. That's on Barnes and Noble. That's on the Nook. That's that's on the Nook. So that's how the Nook is staying in business. That's, that's how Barnes and Noble is staying afloat. Dude. That that okay. off of my erotica exclusively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm responsible for keeping. I, I that wouldn't be bad. But so you know, let's talk about this a little. You, your publisher went under. Yeah. So you've been orphaned. I have been orphaned. I've been there, and I know what that does to you psychologically. Um, it's. I'm not gonna lie. It's been a very rough couple months. Yeah. Writing wise. And you you probably lucky if you're doing six words a day i'm back up to a thousand really yeah well that's what it's been there there was plenty of sit on the couch and cry time yeah. and the best part of it all was i got the the notification that the publisher was going under a couple days before i was laid off from my previous job jesus so i'm like this is great now i got no first job i got no second job I'm like don't worry i'm sure all my creditors <laughs> will books understand are banned from my Kindle, books are getting so banned no from <laughs> you know and, and the first thought is yeah, when you get laid off all right well you know what i can look for a job and i can throw all my time into writing and then you sit down at the computer and you're like i got nowhere to send these books and it doesn't it doesn't kill me because I've self-published and I can self-publish. Right. But uh, you're looking for something beyond. I'm looking that at for this something point. beyond. Yeah. I mean, I've you know when I started self-publishing, I I just wanted to try it. Right. You know, let me see what it is to to do it and and you know stigmas be damned and, and all that because right. it was still early in self-publishing when I started doing it. I remember. And uh, I started making a little bit of money and nobody was kicking in my door telling me I'm a fraud. So I, okay, I did a few more books and I got a little bit, you know, I, I started making some more sales and things were going good. And then I had small press coming to me and saying, you know, hey, we, we read this book. We know that you wrote this book. We saw you did this and this. And they wanted short stories. They wanted novellas. That's how I got my first publisher because my first publisher came to me and said, we want you to do a book for us. And I was like, holy shit, this is the dream. And I mean, this is micro tiny press, but that's how I started going. And I did both for a long time. And then I finally said, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to try to work my way up the publishing ladder and get to with slightly bigger and bigger publishers. And then just when I thought I was getting to the point that I could move up a rung, somebody yanked the ladder out for right. me. And now I'm, I'm back down to square one and, you know, trying to sit at that computer and, and just go, you know what? Ah, fuck everything else. Yeah. I don't care. I'm just, I'm going to make it and I'm going to do it. And then write a couple words here, a couple words there, a couple words here, a couple words there. You yeah. know, you guys threw a fire under my ass when uh, you, you brought me up with the, with the, the Bigfoot, Bigfoot porn. porn. <laughs> I, I heard that in my, my, and I was in, I was in such a bad place at the time that my first reaction was anger. Not at you guys, yeah, but at just at the, you know, like here's Brian Keene throwing me like, just throw me a bone. Like, Hey, 
Chris Jensen will write this, and where you or Dave Barbie, that's the only two people I can think of that could. If, if could I pull was in a off. better place, I could have knocked that out in a week. Yeah. You know, I, I could have done ten thousand words a day and and sent you out a manuscript and say, look, here's the big foot porn that you're talking about last week. Yeah. But I sat down and I rewrote that beginning. 10, 15 times. Really? And I'm still fighting with it. And you were uh, you were a two or three draft guy, right? Yeah. 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 So this is this is killing me. But the, the the beginning that I started with that I scrapped and then went back to and then scrapped and went back to and scrapped starts out with fuck you, Brian Keane. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest opening sentence of all time. <laughs> I'm sold. You got you gotta include Dave Thomas on that. Oh though. no, he's oh he's in there, yeah. Oh. Because then and actually it goes He's I, the Bigfoot? <laughs> no, he's not. Well, the thing is, it's it's metafiction. Right. I am in the act of being raped by Bigfoot. Okay. And it's, fuck you, Brian Keene. And then I grunt as Bigfoot kind of grabs my hips and squeezes them too tight, and I can feel the bones in my hips getting turned to dust. Right. And then I scream out, fuck you, Dave Thomas, and fuck you, you fucking fuck, fuck you, Phoebe. How many fucking fucks is this, you fucking bitch? <laughs> and then I felt bad because Phoebe doesn't deserve to be called a bitch, so I took the bitch part out. <laughs> And I added in like two or three more fucks, and uh, and then I go back and you know wait, let me just start the story at the beginning. So that all yeah, that all appeal to the twelve people that listen to our show. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think part of your struggle with this is related to your problems with Amazon and erotica? No. You don't think in your head you're rewriting, well, are they going to have a problem with this? Do I need to change this? No. Cause actually, a lot of the titles that got pulled, some of them were, were uh, Cat Lexington books, my uh, my alter ego pseudonym. Right. Um, so, I, I and the, the erotica I keep so completely different from what I do. I, I've never bothered looking really for a publisher for the erotica. Right. Because I figured, why, why would I even consider having a, a publisher take out a percentage of the erotica when it sells so well on its own. Right. They're not going to help you. No. They're, yeah. And and you can't really advertise erotica the way you can. No. You know, I, I can't get an ad magazine for, you know, hey, check out, you know, I humped my sister three yeah. <laughs> by, by Cat Lexington to, you know. Is there a way at all to market this stuff other than like, like say you have a Cat Lexington newsletter or something like that? Um, is there any? There really is there anywhere to advertise that stuff? Yeah, you can do a little Facebook, and but you have to be careful with with what you say. Say on Facebook, you need to be careful. But yeah. I, the one thing I haven't done that I'm dying to do is one of the the erotica conventions. The, oh, that, that's true. They have those. They yeah. have those, and they have straight up porn conventions. Yeah. That yeah. I know actresses in the adult industry. Okay. And. They go out to these things, but they want so much more money. I contacted one of the one of the the porn conventions. So you know, hey, look, I'm I, I write erotica and I want to get a table. Yeah. And they're like, well, we don't have tables. We only have booths. And our our small uh, eight foot by eight foot booth is five thousand dollars. Yeah. I was like, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then and they still send me. Yeah, I still get updates on yeah. when they're doing a show, and I would love to do it. And from what I've been told, have you been to one of these? I, I have, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the actresses are there. Yeah. Do yeah. they? The actors or actresses? Are there. They, they they don't do live. Sh- well, they do well, live no. shows. They don't do. Uh, there's no penetration. Oh no, no, I understand sex, that. That's not what I was asking. They do like BDSM. Do they sell autographs like they do at horror oh, shows? Oh, oh, absolutely. So you would pay absolutely. for, you know. Jen James, who probably doesn't do this stuff anymore, but I was just throwing it yeah. out there. Yeah. But you pay, and, no, and what absolutely. They, what's the average charge? Depending on on who it is and how big they are, yeah. um, I haven't gotten in a few years, but eh, twenty five, fifty bucks. Okay, so it's like um, the horror, yeah, like celebrity. Conventions. Oh yeah. Okay. yeah. I gotta be honest with you, man. If I was if I was writing erotica, mm-hmm. and I had a sizable backlist of trade paperbacks, I'd bite the bullet and spend the five grand. And I'll tell you why. Um, there's Kelly Lehman pulling up out there. She's the interview after you. Oh, we stacked them up today. <laughs> I'm just, I'm um, as shit. I'm going to be in the same room as Kelly Lehman. Here's the thing. Would you make $5,000 back in book sales? Probably not. Probably not, but it will open me to a, exactly. a larger audience. Yeah, and that audience yeah. is probably m- more likely to buy that stuff online anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. The, but, I mean, yeah, five grand is a lot of money. I mean, the, the, the reality of it is, at this point, from doing all the conventions that I do, I don't make my money back on my conventions. Right. That's it's, why I've cut down from six or eight to two or three. But it, like you said, it's a marketing thing. It's, it's, that's going to get you in front of an audience. That's the whole thing. I mean, yeah. for, I've been doing conventions now for about four years, and 
I continually run into people that have bought my books either at the convention I'm at for the previous year or from one of the other conventions that I've right. been to. And generally the people that buy one of my books at a convention will buy four, five, six, eight, you know, however yeah. many I have. And I've had actually I've had people come in to have me sign a book that they bought on Amazon, which I was I didn't even know people were buying this book yeah. on Amazon. It's, <laughs> it, cool. it, it still surprises me. Well, maybe but, what you could do, and I don't know how hard this would be, is find somebody to split a booth with. I, I know. I, I've talked to I've talked yeah. to a few people. I, I know a couple actresses in the industry. Yeah. I know a couple people that you know, and and I, I've put out there a couple times. If you're going to do the convention, you know, but. With them, a lot of times they're they don't get their own booth. They're there with their production company, right? And yeah. for that, they won't let me. Yeah, they're not going to let you bring up the space. Booth. Yeah. So. Well, you just have to find somebody because. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Once once I I start going back in and, and going through some of the erotica and, and I'm not going to say reprinting, but but just fixing some of the errors and and getting some some better covers, which I I plan on doing. Um, I'm going to. Uh, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm just he's, he's going full on I'm fanboy full right on now, fanboy. folks. Kelly Lehman uh, joining us here in the studio, and Christian just completely lost his I, train I, of thought. You can't see it because of the beard, but I'm probably blushing. <laughs> I really think I am. I'm just Go ahead, shake her hand. Can I give you a hug? Howdy, howdy. howdy. I'm gonna hug you. I'm hugging Kelly. She, Hi. she Hi. doesn't like to be hugged. Well, she just got a hug, All and right. there's a whole lot of beard in it. So, All right. um, so. I don't know. It's something I would... Here's something you could do. Doesn't your sister-in-law have a t-shirt company? Doesn't she make t-shirts? Uh, it's my uh, my cousin's wife. Your cousin's yeah. wife? Yeah. There you makes... go. T-shirts with your book covers on. Oh, we, we've already discussed that. Yeah? Yeah, I have tiles with my books on them. Yeah. Um, with banned by Amazon at the top <laughs> of every one of them. <laughs> the books banned by Amazon in 37 countries. Too so outrageous to read. You lose your day job bending wrench. Yep. You get kicked off Amazon. Your publisher yep. goes under. Yep. But you're here today to say, I'm back, damn it. I'm and, back and I'm better than ever. Okay. <laughs> and you're working on Bigfoot porn. I am working on Bigfoot porn. Will it be available at, at Scares That Care this year? Which is next month. Yes. It will be. It will be. And how many words do you have written? <laughs> uh, about 6,000 right now. Okay. All right. um, well, you, you, you just promised it to people. I, I, am, I am promising that Bigfoot porn will be made available. The, the metafictional <laughs> the, the metafictional. novella starring Coop and Dave and myself and Phoebe. Yes, everybody is in it. Um, uh, and they're, they're horrible, horrible things are going to happen to many, many people. Now... As it's metafiction, do you and Coop launch a goat into space on a rocket the way you did on in that's episode a, eighteen? That's a good question. I haven't even I don't even think I've brought up the nonsense goats in oh. in there, but but you saved them for the end. But, but now uh, now now I'm thinking they're uh, <laughs> either that or maybe a spinoff. <laughs> the nonsense uh, astronaut goats getting their. Uh, they're rocks off with uh, the Loch Ness monster, perhaps. There you go. Or goats yeah. in space, they can be aliens. Goats in space. Oh, get pro. There you go. See, <laughs> see, I just have to come out and do this show once yeah. a month, and I get all the ideas I need. <laughs> oh man! I have to say that if I'm going to be in a Bigfoot porn novel, this is one of the proudest moments of my life. I'm very excited. <laughs> you haven't read it yet. That doesn't matter. The fact that I'm going to be in a Bigfoot porn novel, the genre I wish I well, actually, I wish I invented the dinosaur erotica, but Bigfoot erotica is right up there. You know, something I wish I invented. Absolutely. And so. You know, I will say this though: it is not simply Bigfoot that is doing all the. Uh, uh, don't don't spoil it. <laughs> no, you know that, they have some surprises. That, there, there are there are lots of lots of surprises, and you know, um, you know somebody gets their lucky charms. That's all I'm going to say. Um, also, I just have a request. Yes. Work ice bad into the story. I, oh, wow. I will do that. Okay. I thank you. <laughs> thank you. I can't promise what's going to happen to ice. Bad. Well, that's okay. I just I, I'm very excited about this idea. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I find it interesting that you're going to sell it scares a care. But <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know we're helping families with bigfoot porn. <laughs> yes. Well, you know it's all for the children. That's that's why I write bigfoot erotica for the children. For the children. Joe, I just want to remind you that this was unscripted. <laughs> I know you're listening right now. Actually, Joe was Joe was part of a thread. He, he came in one of the threads when I was mentioning bigfoot 
erotica, Bigfoot porn. <laughs> right. And he said something about keeping the tentacles out, or so. So I think Joe may end up in Bigfoot porn with tentacles. I, I don't know happening. how Joe would feel about that. <laughs> I would remind you that, that he's an ex Baltimore City cop. That is true. I was going to say <laughs> but, he knows how to dispose of a body and not get caught. So <laughs> you may want to rethink that one. What well, hasn't been all doom and gloom for you? Um, no. You recently added the word actor to your resume. <laughs> Very uh, loosely, yes. Yeah, you yes. played the role of Zimmerman in Dusty Fleischman's Dead Men Tell No Tales. Is that correct? That is correct. Absolutely. Uh, how did that come about? Um, from doing the conventions, I made friends with a lot of people. And uh, actually, uh, Dusty and Rita, who run um, Creepy Crawl Entertainment, were at Scares of Care last year. Right. And I've known them from just being around small films and, and some of the other acting that I've done that hasn't actually seen the light of day yet. Right. Um, and I got the offer to to go out to, to Maryland and film this this movie, Dead Men Tell No Tales. So I went out and I got to be the asshole boss. <laughs> and it, this, Was that a stretch for you? Was that no, no. Oh, I'm a giant asshole okay. in real life. Yeah, yeah. Um, fucking asshole for, for Phoebe. Um, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't acting and, and I... A couple of my friends, we, we had a screening at at, uh, at my house for, for the movie, and the one thing they agreed on was that I wasn't acting at all. I'm just that much of an asshole in real life, and I, I just got the, the perfect... You just got handed something by Kelly Lamb, and the perfect what? The, the beauties and the beast desperately seeking Yeti. It's kind of big, Bigfoot porn. It is kind of. It is and not it's, kind it's, of. It's a little. The rumors different. are true. The bigger the feet, the bigger the meat. <laughs> it does. It does. It's a, dot 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 dot. It's, it's a little embarrassing that I could run out to my car and, and, and grab Bigfoot grab porn. Big out of porn. My car. You make sure Dungeon Master seventy seven point one is not eavesdropping <laughs> this show. Okay. <laughs> Yep. Okay. He, he's good. He's in there playing. All right. All right. Um, yeah, but the uh, the the acting thing came out uh, pr- pretty quick, and I went out for one day and filmed my scenes with him, and uh, that would have been the the third or fourth movie that I had made, but I'd never seen the finished product on any of them. Uh, so a lot of the independent stuff, you work on it for a while, and then either they lose funding or something happens, and you know, so. None of the other stuff came out, so I went out, I did my part, and then. But Dusty has a real good reputation for getting these movies done and, and putting them out. Absolutely. And, and uh, actually, talking to him at when we were filming, he's talking about this this young independent filmmaker that he met at Scares of Care that came up and <laughs> was talking to him and that the that. Oh no! And he does no, special effects, and, yeah. and he did he did this movie called The Stall, and I jump up and I yell, "That's my bitch!" <laughs> And he, he looks at me, he goes, I, I don't I don't remember his name. I said, it's Mike Lombardo. He's like, that, yeah, yeah. That He's like, the, the stall was incredible. I'm like, dude, this kid is good. So I, that, you know, that was my uh, my little push for, for, for Mike to, to, to do some work out there with him. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, it's the, the community of, of people that are doing this stuff. It Everybody knows everybody. Right. It's just like the writing world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Except we're not dealing with the, the bigger stars, right. you know, so much. Every once in a while, somebody pops in, but they'll come in and they'll film a couple things for a day, and then they're they're out the door. Yeah. Um, but you know, the the coolest thing with this though was they did the premiere at the four state pop culture con convention in uh, in Maryland. Boy, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe we're going to guy, guy Matt Burns runs it. Really cool guy. Um, so it's a very small convention, but he did a great job setting it up. And they did the premiere in a movie theater. Yeah. So I got to see myself on screen for the first time on a movie screen. Nice. Which was, I mean, I I, I, I got hard. Yeah. <laughs> Not just because I'm a sexy, sexy man, but I was like, oh, my God, I'm in a freaking movie. And I'm sitting in a theater watching myself. On a freaking screen. It was. I'm a fucking. I'm gonna lose my title. God damn it. <laughs> fuck, 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 fuck. You're not gonna hit your and Coop's record. Then. No, no. Well, Coop's no. not here. Well, so Coop's not, not yeah. here. So I'm yeah. already. Yeah. Coop added to at least half of those hundred. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you know the, the fact that I'm sober now doesn't 
I was going to say, the bourbon helped a lot, too. And I <laughs> I was, I didn't know how to feel about the, the one. I, I get my notification on Facebook. Dave Thomas mentioned you. And I go in and the only time that, uh, first off, I never drink. And the only time anybody was drinking was when Christian Jensen was on. I'm like, ah, that's my legacy is that <laughs> I was a drunken idiot talking about well, nonsense goats in space. I, I, the- have to, I have to <laughs> point out that that was in response to uh, – somebody's critique of Brian and I. Craig Spector? Yeah, uh, doing reporting. And he says, it's just two guys sitting around a table that are drunk. And again, I point out, I don't drink during the show because I got to drive home an hour when well, I'm done. And Coop hasn't drank since he was 14. Yeah, so. I was going to say, Coop doesn't drink. And uh, I yeah. rarely drink on the yeah. show. I do occasionally. Occasionally, I, but look, it's rare. Look, let's just nip this in the bud, okay? Yeah. Um, Craig Spector hasn't been relevant since 1996. Now, he's back now and... and <laughs> He wants people to remember that he used to write books, too, um, except he doesn't really write them anymore. Um, he needs to find something to get people to pay attention to him. Hey, why not latch on to the biggest dog in the room? Oh, my. Here we go. Except, you know, <laughs> the biggest dog in the room just doesn't care, little yip dog. And you can stay back there at my tail and yip all you want. I'm not paying attention to you. Is anybody paying attention? Because I'll start making funny online all day if that's going to get me some books. You know, if, if I mean, <laughs> here's the thing. For 20 years people now, people tried have to... thought that yeah. would work. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Hey, Maurice Broadus wrote a great, great essay yeah. about this in 2005. And it still works today. He, he wrote about how if people wanted to get noticed... They would try to pick a fight with myself or Nick Mom. That was from the forum, forum, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that was from the forum. I remember that. <laughs> you know, and now Coop has divorced himself from this world, except for his appearances on the show. But Mamatas and I are still readily available. And, yeah, you know, once in a while, people still think this is a good idea. It is not. <laughs> yeah. That, that, <laughs> it never works out in their favor. Isn't that why the forum died? Because it just kind of what it turned into was just... My old forum? No, it, it wasn't so much that. It was... Uh, it was just it, people weren't using it in the spirit of what it was intended for. Yeah, it was turning into another shock lines. And, and, I was just trying to get laid on there. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know that was the spirit it was intended for. Oh, yeah, it, it worked as soon as I, I met Blasi and Lombardo. And, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, Craig, look, Craig Spector certainly entitled to his opinion, um, and his opinion is just that is an opinion. And you know, if the four other people who agree with his opinion on Facebook want to agree with it, that's fine and dandy. Um, I'm allowed to express my opinion too. And, you know, it's my opinion that, uh, you know, apologizing for a rapist or apologizing for what the hell is that? Apparently I never turned my phone off. <laughs> you know, I, I don't We don't need to get in a whole Craig Spector thing. That is true. Yeah, you know, true. I, I don't know. Let's get back to you. Let's, yeah, look look at you. Let's get back to the you. important you, thing. You're, you're <laughs> starring in a film. You're yes. banned by Amazon. Yes. You're launching Goats in the Space with Coop. And, and my, how far you've come since attending my college class. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has been, uh, it's been a long time. It is has. he the most successful person from your college class? Ah. Uh, he is. Yeah. Absolutely, he is. But well, we a- <laughs> I, you should scratch that last part because no one's ever going to attend a class you teach. <laughs> no, we had, I mean, Michelle Mixel has been published. Right. Nikki Graybeal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christian and a couple other people. Not her. Um, but. Yeah, because I knew you had people in the class that didn't write horror. So right. I'm just curious, like. Yeah, you know, one of my romance or something and it sold like 10 million books. I have no idea. I always but, wonder what happened to the mom. Do you remember the mom? The, the one that was there with her son? Yeah. Yeah. Now, her son has been published. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah. Um, but I thought she had real talent. But I think I was saying some things that that were shocking to her about, you know, money-wise, yeah. financial-wise. Yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of rainbows and, and, yeah. and puppy I've dogs. Always, I've always class. wondered if she stuck with it. I hope she did. I don't, I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I never. I didn't talk to them that much. Yeah. You know. I mean, I, I was. You were making a three-hour drive from Jersey each <laughs> Tuesday night. Yeah. He'd drive down after bending wrench all day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he'd drive home that night, six hours every yeah. Tuesday. I'm, I'm not a smart man. I hope it was worth it. <laughs> it would, you know, it, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't worth it. So there you, just, go. you know, if nothing else. It's got a few appearances on this show. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So you're yeah. you're one of the the rare few. It's been on more than once. Well, I am special. him, him, uh, Damian, Angelica, Walters, Swartwood, Swartwood, Lombardo, yeah, uh, Kelly. soon Kelly Layman, 
Uh, no, Bob Ford has only been on once. Well, I was just about, no, no, twice. Halloween show. Halloween show, right. so he's been on okay. twice, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and Kelly, so, and, so, and I am that's special. it, yeah. You are, so, you're definitely you're, special. You're special. <laughs> yeah. I should get banned by you Amazon more often. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, speaking about things of questionable taste that could get banned from Amazon <laughs> in your acting career. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like a, a plug for one of my books. Uh, yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about Joe Fleischicker. Of course, he was the star of... Uh, Trauma's Toxic Avenger, yes, Poultry yes. Guy, Sergeant Kabuki Man, NYPD, etc. Um, he recently passed, yes. and you wrote a tribute to him. You said, quote, that he was your first and favorite autograph, a big man with a giant heart. Talk a little about meeting him. Was that before you wanted to do all this? Yeah, this was, Christ, about 10 years ago, probably. Yeah. Um, not before I wanted to write. That was always and forever. But right. before I even... I, the, the thought of being in a movie never even occurred to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, I got the face for radio. I don't have, you know, the, the, the chops to, to be an actor or a leading man or, you know. You could play an Amish guy with that beard. <laughs> <laughs> Amish porn is my the next frontier, I think. Sure, not butter. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and he said that without I may or may not have too. sat around for about a half an hour discussing this one time with, with uh, I'm not going to say her name, <laughs> Phoebe. <laughs> so we may have worked out a plot. <laughs> so, so the title will be Phoebe's Amish porn <laughs> subtitle churning the butter churning the butter yes. uh, yeah Joe flight I have a, a friend of mine that I go to I've been going to conventions with for about 20 years right. all the horror conventions and he's a huge huge autograph guy he's got everybody I mean huge actors and he's just I've never seen the point in getting an autograph right you know I mean if it's I, I don't know it just doesn't seem like it's that important I'd rather have a story that I met the person and talked to them you know, right? That that I like, but to to have you know a picture with their their signature on it, I don't. It just doesn't appeal to me. Right. But we're uh, we're we're walking down the hall, and you, you couldn't miss Joe Fleischaker because the man was four hundred pounds. Right. And he was sitting at the table, and I saw him, and I just kind of stopped, <laughs> and I was like, "Holy shit!" I'm like, "That's Joe Fleischer," and I'm I may have been the only person who knew his name. Right. You know, and I I've just always been a huge B movie fan. Right. So. I saw him and I was like, you know what? I'm going to talk to him. And I never talked to a celebrity before, really. Right. And, you know, as, as much of a celebrity as, as Joe is. But we, uh, I go walking up and I, I start talking. And I said, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. And he just kind of laughs. He's like, nobody's my fan. And, and we start talking. And then he goes in and tells me every movie that he's been in. He's telling me behind the scenes stuff. He's talking about working with, uh, with Lloyd Kaufman, who I've met probably a dozen times since then. Right. But, but at that moment, like the thought of that, I was talking to somebody who had worked with Lloyd Kaufman was just too much for me. Right. And uh, I talked to him for I think a half hour or so, and I said, "Well, you know, I got to buy one of these movies. You, you have to sign it for me." And he, "Oh, absolutely!" And he he signed it. And he he signed a copy of Troma's War. Right. And in Troma's War, he shoots somebody in the back, so he signed it. To Chris, watch your back, Joe Fleischaker. Yeah. And uh, next year, different convention, I see Joe again, and I go up to him, and now I'm, I'm talking, and he remembered me. Right. And we're, we're talking, and we're talking. He never said specifically, I remember you from the last convention, but the way we were talking, I, I was like, I actually think he remembered me from from the, the from a year ago. And uh, I'm getting ready to leave, and I, I bought a couple movies, and I had left talking to him and was talking to some other people and went back to say goodbye to him and he has a picture for me he says oh, i signed this for you i want you to have it and it was a picture from one of the other movies and it says to chris keep watching so nice. i have two autographs watch your back and keep watching both yeah. from him he knew exactly who i was anytime i saw him at another convention you know he went over and talked to me and you know where i went over and talked to him and just just a really nice guy that just was was his heart was as big as everything else on him you know and just really cool down to earth fun guy knew who he was you know and i saw him somewhere in jersey i was i was shopping somewhere and i saw him and he was he was just out just out and about yeah Yeah, he's in a scooter doing some shopping and i went over and i talked to him he's chris how's it going so i i was he remembered your name he remembered me yeah yeah, it was absolutely amazing. I, I felt like I was important. Hold on one second. We have Dungeon Master 77.1 coming into the <laughs> studio. What's up, buddy? Uh, Did you forget what you came in here to ask us? No. No? Are you just eavesdropping? 
Just talk about what you're doing. I want to ask you something. Okay, you want me to come in there and ask me? Okay. You you guys carry on. We'll continue. <laughs> we'll continue our conversation. Um, so uh, yeah. No, that's, I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I had something else too to talk about along those lines with, with Joe Fleischaker, and I, I have no, I, I, it completely slipped my so mind. So I'm like you, the autograph thing. Like I'll get books signed, yeah. but to get like a celebrity's picture or something, it yeah. doesn't. I'd rather talk to somebody. Oh yeah, it, like to have a story. Yeah, exactly. And also, I worked in Hollywood, so I got over the celebrity People, thing oh, really oh, quickly. Yeah. yeah, like really fast. Yeah. So everyone was always like, "Oh my God, you!" Really? And I'm like, yeah, really, it's not a big deal. You know, you know. There's so people used to come to visit and be like, "Where are we going to spot celebrities?" I'm like, "Where I work, and we're not going there." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, It's always been like there's only been a couple times I, I fanboyed out. Um. Meeting Jack Ketchum. You introduced me to, to Oh, Dallas. yeah, I remember that. That was... I, I felt like a complete idiot. <laughs> I really did. Um, and uh, I, I've met... There's so many big-name authors that I've met that a couple of them I, I, I fanboyed out. Some That's of them, the way I was the first time I met Kelly's dad, Richard Lehman. Um, Kelly, you might remember this. World Horror 99 in Atlanta. I'm supposed to interview your dad for Masters of Terror. Oh, yeah. And we go in this little auditorium. It wasn't being used. It's 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 Dick Lehman, Ann, and Kelly, and myself. And I had two pages of questions. I asked one. <laughs> one question was, or one page? I was fucking tongue-tied. I asked oh, one yeah. question. And everything else was basically just, you're Richard Lane. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to read a transcript of that interview. <laughs> It's out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's on the internet somewhere. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, the, the first time I met you, now I'm not, I don't need to add to your ego because you know I know it's 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 got middle to zip code at this <laughs> point, as Coop would say. But uh, yeah, um, was at uh, what the hell the, the the premiere for the Ties of Bind. Right. And I was talking to Lombardo and Blasi and 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 those guys and uh, Jeff Heinbuck. Yep. And uh, I I knew them from the forum, and I just I saw them when we started talking, and great bunch of guys. They bring me right in, and you came over to talk to them, and you said something, and I'm like, it's fucking Brian Keene, <laughs> and I was like, it's Brian Keene, and and they're like, yeah, so he's an <laughs> asshole. And I'm like, holy shit, that's Brian Keene. And after the screening, we 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 all hung out, and we I was went like, to that bar, yeah, yep. yeah. And I was like, he's a normal fucking guy. Well, look, a. When I was coming up, you know, Dallas, Dick Lehman, Ed Lee, those guys, they, they never, you know, they never acted bigger than they were. Sure, some of them have personas. Lee has a very different public persona than his private persona. Holy shit, you know, he is one of the coolest motherfuckers I've but, ever met. But, you know, you, they'll sit down, they'll converse with you. Like, oh, yeah. I, I always thought you should do the same thing. And, you know, yeah, yeah. There, are, there are authors who don't do that. I've met a couple of those. I don't want to be one of those people. And yeah. I see you at conventions. You're you're the same way. And I I, I have I like that because it's a it's a paying it forward thing. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. You're, you're you're the same way with your readers that come up to you. Oh yeah, and and not just the readers though, but there's a lot of because I, I've had that self published moniker. With you're me starting to mentor people. other people. I, I I've that. had a lot of people that, that have asked me things. I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I'm mentoring. It makes me sound more important than I well, really am. Well, you're giving out advice. But, but yeah, and if I can save somebody a couple steps or, or help somebody out, you right. know, I uh, I wrote, <laughs> I actually wrote a, an a autobiography for, I, I ghost wrote it for someone else who, who's transgendered. Yeah. And uh, she, she sent me a, a copy of the book and, and I read it. I was like, this is the best story that I've ever read. Right. Most horribly written story I've ever read, <laughs> but as painful as it was to read it, just I couldn't stop going through it because yeah. the shit that this woman went through when she was transitioning, born born a man, and and went went through the the whole process, and the book ends years, uh, probably about five years ago. Right. Um, and there there's supposed to be a second book attached to that that kind of explains her her progress you know from right. from there to there but but uh it was, she contacted me for information on self-publishing and we started talking a little bit right. and uh we got to know each other and that i ended up ghostwriting the, the book for her right. and in i think a week i ended up giving her like ninety thousand words wow 
It was. I mean, it was based on. You learned a little from Jim Moore too. <laughs> <laughs> when when I when I get it in me, I can I can put work out. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can really put put work out, and I, I did that while I was working full time too. Yeah. Ninety thousand words in a week, you know. But I have no problem with ten thousand words in a day. Yeah. If if it's there, I can't anymore. You know. Without, well, I don't have I a can choice. Do, now. I can do eighty thousand a month. We proved that earlier this year. I can still do that. Yeah. Not the way I used to. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, I, I still get up at three o'clock in the morning every day. Yeah. Depend. It doesn't matter what time I'm going in work. If I'm going in at five, six, or seven, I'm up at three a.m. and I sit down at the computer. Whether the words come or they don't, I will not get up. I'll write and rewrite and erase and change and do whatever. But there's no internet. There's no distractions. There's no bullshit. It's me and the computer three a.m. until I leave for work. Right. And I, I fought from almost nothing back up to a thousand words. Good. And. Uh, you know, now I'm going to have to do considerably better than that since I promised to have Bigfoot porn done well, in time for scare. Now, let, now let me ask you this because you're okay. You're you're out of the doldrums. You've gotten past being orphaned by your publisher. Oh, yeah. you? I didn't you're even like that back. publisher. So. Well, uh, this is what happens. <laughs> but I'm looking for a new publisher. <laughs> <laughs> you, wink, wink. You're 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 coming back. I'm coming back. Okay. Things are starting to go right again. Joe Fleischer. Mm -hmm. dies recently you had a connection to him yeah um you know jf gonzalez tom piccarelli you've got kids you've got 40 titles out there tell me you've got a literary estate no why because uh, that you hear us say it all the time yeah. why yeah i don't know i just never never I, the business end of it still has me stymied with a all lot right of stuff forget it forget the big put Bigfoot porn. This is what I want you to promise me. Before scares occur, you'll have one drawn up. All right, I won't. It doesn't cost you a lot of money. Yeah. We we know the name of a guy, Les Clinger. Yeah. Okay. Les Clinger, or you know, I don't know what Les charges. And for for listeners out there, yeah, Les Clinger, or uh, you know, Neil Gaiman has a wonderful template on his website that oh, you yeah. can download in a PDF form. Okay. You know, and maybe run that by Les. I mean, you know. Yeah. Look, I don't care where you are in your career. You can have just sold your first short story. You can be where Christian is. You can be where I am. You got to have that. Yeah, that's true. Very good advice. You know, you look at somebody like David Silva. You know, the legendary David Silva passed away without one. Yeah. And how you got poor Rob Swartwood wondering what to do with all David's stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah. Or uh, I'll give you another example. Okay, now, Jesus passed. He had a very concrete you know, here's what I want done with all this stuff. Yeah. But in going through his storage and his files, his wife, Kathy and I, we found writings for uh, Mike Baker. We found writings for Mark Williams. We, we found all their unpublished stuff. Oh. Nobody knows who that goes to, who owns the rights. Yeah. Jesus had it. Yeah. You know, so it, we can't do anything with it, which is a shame. You want, you, you know, you want that legacy taken care of. Yeah. And with you with kids, man, especially. Yeah. So we will talk more about this off the air, but you do that before you finish the Bigfoot point. I will. All I right. Will. All right. <laughs> Last question for you, um, because I'm sure uh, Dave and I will be talking about this on the show. Um, in regards to AMC's adaptation of Preacher, <laughs> you recently wrote about the pilot, and let me quote. Okay. So I started to watch Preacher on AMC last night. Holy shit balls, that was terrible. <laughs> they fucked up every single character and screwed up a brilliant plot. I made it through a half before I couldn't take the clusterfuck anymore and shut it off. Then I forced another half hour just to be sure. Eating my own cold, day-old vomit is better than watching that shit. End quote. Have you gone back for episode two? <laughs> I did. I changed my mind. I love the show. No, I, I fucking hate it. I yeah? Just, I, I hate everything about it. You're a big fan of the comic. I'm a, I, I've am I read it three times. Yeah. Um. Recently, because I knew when I heard that Preacher was coming out, holy shit, I can't wait for this. And I'm not, I don't watch a ton of television, you know, um. I could not wait for this. So I, right away, I run back, grab my, my first graphic novel, and I start rereading it again. And uh, it it's so it's written so fucking well right. that reading it for a third time, you're still floored by how well it is. Absolutely. It's, and the intricacies of the story and the things that go on that you may forget certain little pieces of it that you're just, I, I can't believe 
how brilliant this is. And then I started watching it. And I, I, I was very, very concerned when I started seeing some of the, the sneak peeks and coming attractions right. and all that. Um, I didn't like Cassidy. Um, I, I don't know who the guy is. I never bothered looking him up. But if he really is Irish or Scottish or whatever. He, Cassidy was Irish in the comic. In the comic, he's Irish, yeah. yeah. The, the guy that plays him, I don't think he is because that accent is just ass. Um, I don't know. Everything I, I, about I it. Yeah. Everything about it. Yeah. Um, Tulip, holy shit. Don't even get me started with that. Tulip is this iconic badass chick that will seduce you from across the room and kill five guys on the way to you, fuck the shit out of you, kill three more guys, and then disappear, and you're madly in love with her. And they have this, like, 12-year-old girl who looks so fucking innocent playing her. you got to be kidding me. She can't be badass. She looks like she just walked out of eighth grade. And when she's... That, that intro scene in the cornfield, whatever the fuck that garbage was supposed to be... I know it wasn't the hunting trip with her father from the comics. No, no. It was just... It was bad action that was supposed to be made better because they're driving through a cornfield. (laughs) So, not only do you have poorly acted and directed and choreographed fight scenes with a girl who looks like she's a pedophile's dream, but you do it to the soundtrack of corn beating on the car. (laughs) Alright, yeah, sure. And then you see her, and you can't really see her. When she came out and I saw her, and I'm like, alright, doesn't really look like her. None of them really look like them. And then I'm like, she's a cute little girl. Yeah. How the fuck am I supposed to believe that this is some badass chick who's been through hell when she she looks fresh as a daisy? Right. You know, she's supposed to be like this battered, beaten, war-torn beauty but still just there's supposed to be so much life in this girl yeah when we meet her on the, in the comics she's on the run from the mob yeah you know and then and of she's course, not visiting her uncle who the fuck is her uncle yeah where the hell did that come from <laughs> and what's all this you fucking tom cruise gets blown up in the church of scientology the fuck bullshit fuck you no no are you kidding me you know what i i understand like with The Walking Dead, they they did good with mixing the comic, with changing it up. Right. You know, because you can't do a play-by-play from the comic because then it's boring and nobody's going to watch it because you know what's going to happen. Right. Um, I, you I, feel with Preacher, they overextended they, in that regard. They, they didn't even do it. They, they might as well have said, this is fucking Tulip's Revenge. It's a completely different fucking TV show, loosely based on the comic. Yeah. I don't hate it as much as you, but I don't love it. Um, my, my thing with Preacher, Preacher was the easiest comic to hand somebody that doesn't read comic books. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Coop. Coop hates comic books. Yeah. Hates superheroes. Wants nothing to do with any of that. I handed him the first volume of Preacher, and I said, read this. If you don't like it, you can punch me. Well, he was delighted to hear this. <laughs> and he went into it expecting to be able to punch me. Instead, he came back and he said, you got volume two, right? Yeah. It's a gateway drug for oh, people who don't read comics. Oh, it absolutely is. And it is... It's written by an Irishman, drawn by an Englishman, but it is it is a quintessential American story. It's an examination oh, yeah. of America. Yeah, but from, it's, from the outside in. Right, but it's done on the road. Yeah. And the fact that they're centering it in this one location. Now, I understand. There's budgetary concerns. That, hey, we know I can, AMC. I can give cheap. you that. Okay, I get why they're doing that. I just don't see it working long but, run. But they took the biggest part of the backstory and fucked that up. But that now Jesse is taking over his father's parish. Yeah. I no. Wasn't, I wasn't crazy about that. The only thing I liked they did was that they showed his father getting shot in front of him. Right. That's the only thing that they carried over correctly. And... I would hope if they adapt War in the Sun or my favorite uh, when... And spoilers, I guess we have to say spoilers. When, when the Grail... Kidnaps yeah. Cassidy because they think he's Jesse. Oh, yeah. And, and Jesse's got to go rescue him. Oh, yeah, yeah. When they adapt, I hope somebody at AMC 
puts up some money and lets them go shoot on location. Oh, we're you, screwed. You can't <laughs> you can't do that the way they've got the show set up now. No, 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 not even a little bit. But there's so much from. I get that there's a lot they can't do when you love something so much. You you you'd never expect it to be that good. Right. But to 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 twist and change and then. I, I don't care about budgetary constraints because there's plenty of low budget movies out there that are amazing. Right. You know, and there's there's a lot of TV shows that are amazing. And, you know, to, to especially the first fucking episode, you, you can't go out of your way to make the first episode good. <laughs> I mean, are you that fucking? I, I, I've been annoyed at AMC that I, I fell out of love with The Walking Dead. Yeah, oh, I, well. Dave and I haven't watched it this season. Well, I guess Dave's been watching. I watched about yeah. half of the season. There's still five or six episodes on my DVR. You can see I'm in a real hurry to get to them. We like, haven't been yeah. talking about no. it. Yeah, 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 no. And then, I, then the, the whole fear of The Walking Dead thing. Uh, just, I hated every character from yeah. the beginning. No, that's a complete disaster. When even Christopher Golden hates your television show, yes. you know you've got a flop on he, your hands. He, he still says one of the worst TV shows ever is the best thing is ever on television. So. What's that? Sons of Anarchy. That's he theory. says it's well, one of the best TV shows ever, if not the best. Parts of it were. Yeah, it's sure. Just, first two seasons. The, the, exactly. And then the first you're like, two seasons. But then it, it, I loved it up until the last season and with the, the uh, premiere of the first you, episode you of the last the season. Sopranos all the way through, though. I love The Sopranos all the way through. Oh. Don't you? Well, we will fight. I'll, we'll go outside. Uh, all, my, all my guns are here in the house. Did you travel with one today? No, you came from New Jersey. <laughs> I do have a very big truck. <laughs> There's a lot of boxes that lock on it. So it's very big AR-15 that'll take down that truck. I'm not saying I'll drive. I'm just saying you'll know it's in my truck. But well, no. But it's different for me though because I'm a Jersey guy. Yeah. And just traveling a lot when The Sopranos was on, and it was, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from New Jersey. Oh, hey, forget about it. Are oh, you in the mud? Shut the fuck up. We don't talk like that. See, that's that's not it for me at all. Oh. It, it, it doesn't even have to do with the mob. No, it, it's about it, family. It's it's about being torn between two families. It's your work, work family, family and your and your brother. And, yeah. Uh, Mary had never watched it, and she's like, she's like, all right, let's watch. And so we binge watched it. Yeah. And I didn't say a word. And. The first episode ends, and she looks at me, and she's like, oh, my God, if you had grown up Italian and in the mob. And I'm like, you get it, right? If, if you take out the mob and make it horror writers, that show speaks to me on every goddamn level. Every goddamn level. <laughs> trying to think, who would that make me? What would that make you? Yeah, what would that make um, me? The, the guy from Doogie Howser. Uh, the actor Max he, Casella. Max Casella. He plays Benny. You're my Benny. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to rewatch it. Remember who the fuck Benny is. Benny's Benny's good. Benny's with Tony to the end. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just didn't want to get like raped at the pool cue or. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, he he gets he gets beat up at one point by Christopher, but. Yeah. All right. I can deal. So that. Robert Ford beats you up. But, all right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Bob Ford. Oh, yeah, Bob, Bob Ford's, Ford's my Christopher. Okay. So he knows it. You know I love you, Bob, but you know you are. <laughs> I told him that one drunk in New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what what does that make Dave? Uh. I don't know. Mary I, says Dave is Hesh. I've never been able to figure out who Dave is. Yeah, he's come up with like seven different theories. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know. really fit. I don't fit in anyway. I don't know. I'm gonna say big pussy just because I want to say pussy on on the right. show. Yeah, so. he'd make a good big pussy. I, I would have thought like uh, the the one that the guy from the E Street Band. Uh, Silvio? Yeah. No, that was Jesus. Yeah, that was Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. 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 The other thing is, I can't Jesus. be big pussy because I would never rat out my friends ever. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Anybody knows me. Did that? Yeah. Throw Silvio. Other than that, I would. Great, yeah, yeah, but I, that would never, I would never. Yeah, do we're that. having two different shows right now. You and I are talking <laughs> in microphone one, and they're talking in microphone two. How's that gonna so, sound? So who, this is different than anything crazy, else we uh, recorded today. Who's, who's the crazy uncle that should have been in charge of the mob, but was Uncle June? Uncle June, yeah. Tom Montalion. You don't see that? Oh no, yeah. <laughs> totally fit. <laughs> who's Uncle Junior? Uncle Junior's Mont de Leon. Oh, oh, oh okay. yeah. I, I, I just always knew it was Uncle Junior. I didn't know his real name. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, we've covered a lot of things here today, but and the main thing we want to say is you may be banned from Amazon, but you're back, goddammit. I'm and, and fucking back. Where can people find you? <laughs> uh, Are, is it still hard writing, Dad, at Blogspot? Uh, yeah, but I haven't written a blog in fucking forever. Okay. Um, 
it gets down to do Blog, I, blogging is so 2014. It really is. It really <laughs> is. And actually, you know, Project I Radio, um, thanks to uh, another uh, another Kelly that that we know, um, they contacted me about doing a, a podcast. Right. They wanted me to do an erotica podcast. They wanted me to to have a female co-host. Um, I had a couple in mind. I talked to a couple of them, but I wasn't happy with with anybody. So right. I never got back to them. So they're probably like, "Fuck you!" And you're you're you know. That idea is fucking dead. But yeah. are you gonna do it via Skype? That's why I was trying to decide. That's why I was gonna talk to you because I didn't know the logistics of doing it for Skype on, on Skype. Versus well, we can get into that off the air. Yeah, but I still I still need to find a female co-host. Sephora and you're on. That's know. an excellent suggestion. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. who immediately comes. Yeah. To yeah, we'll put you in touch with. Yeah, her. put me in touch with her. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, that would be a great show. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. so where should folks go to find you since you're not? Uh, Facebook, usually Twitter. Um, there are still books that are not banned on Amazon, <laughs> and there's none of the books are banned on Barnes and Noble, so you can do that. Uh, you can't go to my publisher's website because they fucking suck and they died. Um, <laughs> they probably deserved it. Um, no, I don't. I don't wish them rotting herpes of the face. Too much. That may be a little. You know. You know. No, I wish them rotting herpes. Just a face. little bit of face herpes. Yeah, face herpes. <laughs> fuck them in the fucking goat ass. Face fuck herpes them. is my new band. Fuck them in the goat ass and then send them in fucking space. That's what I fucking do with those motherfuckers. Um, I don't know what my fuck count is, but I, I know I'm still behind. I'll have to when I edit the show. I have, to, I have to at least Coop, put an Coop, effort in. You gotta, you gotta figure Coop's at home listening, and yeah. he's probably thrown in a few extras for you. So. Oh, and oh, and speaking of Coop, I heard. Uh, a minute maybe of his Game of Thrones, <laughs> but I had to turn it off because I, I started binge watching because you told me I, I'd love it, which I fucking do. Yeah. Um. So I've been binge watching it. I'm up to. I just started season four. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't know if he'd actually watch something. Coop's never seen an episode. I didn't think That's so. That's why we had him review it. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't want to take a chance and have him because I've successfully, which I don't know how, but I've successfully learned nothing about the show. Because I always knew at some point I was going to watch it. Right. So whenever someone, you know, I mean, I, I know a couple things, but I'm kind of just trying to forget that I know them. Right. And in the hopes that I'll be somewhat surprised when when that does pop up. But, um, yeah, I heard the Coop thing. And I was like, nope, i got to turn off because I was listening to a couple episodes of the podcast that I'd missed on my way when I was on my three-hour drive up here today. Oh, okay. So I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to be on the show, maybe I should actually listen to this fucking thing that I haven't heard since I was on it. <laughs> Dungeon Master 77.1 has something to tell you, Christian. I hear it. No, I can actually hear you saying <laughs> but the we, F word f- from down here. But we told you, you keep your eyes closed. You can hear him say the F word yes. from the living room. Oh, dear. Yes. All right. Keep your eyes closed. <laughs> No, you don't walk with your eyes closed. You're going to run into the, the kitchen door. Yes, that's, that's not right. You go play. We're almost done, okay? Watch your language. Watch oh! your language. <laughs> Sorry, Dungeon Master. You've been told. <laughs> I've, I, You've been scolded. I, 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 Mic drop, or he's going to send Jason. Oh, well, so. That'd be, actually, I know him, so I'm not really go. concerned. He's going to send Kane Otter after this. Yeah, yes. yeah. So. <laughs> All right, Christian Jensen, thanks for coming back to the show. Thank we you for, for, for the momentary lapse of. Uh, uh, Business savvy and allowing me to return. <laughs> <laughs> see how see how the ratings are on this show. People are gonna be like, "He was sober." <laughs> no. All right, Dave. Let's hop back in the time machine. Okay, and one more time. Uh, this week's episode was brought to you by Thunderstorm Books, publishing the absolute finest signed limited edition hardcovers on the collectible market today. Uh, they're Titles that are currently available include Jonathan Jans's imprint and Habamock by Ryan C. Thomas. Coming up this summer, new titles from James Newman, Tim Curran, and Christopher Rufty. Visit them online at thunderstormbooks.com. This week's show is also brought to you by Darkling Incidents, Obscure Reflections by K.M. Tonso, published by Nightscape Press. Herein are contained reflections of what, as St. Paul says, we see in a glass darkly. 
And as this angle of incidence is so shadowed, so must be the reflections it derives. These sixteen stories provide obscure reflections of worlds much like ours, yet different. Worlds that grapple with increasingly confused and distorted realities. Each reflection so vivid as to become an open doorway, where unwary readers might just find themselves stumbling over the threshold, never to return. Darkling incidents... Obscure Reflections is an elegant and dark mix of disturbing short stories written in exquisite and poetic prose. All editions include gorgeous cover and interior artwork by Luke Spooner of Carrion House. It's now on Kindle, on Amazon, and in trade paperback at all, all major book retailers. So we thank both of them for sponsoring the show. Um, Coming up in future episodes, now remember, I'm about to head out on the road for three months, so... Rather than tell you what's scheduled for next week, we don't know what's scheduled for next week because we're going to kind of be playing this by ear for the next three months. But I can tell you, confirmed, confirmed now, coming up over the next three months, we have interviews with D. Alexander Ward, John Skip, Laura Lee Barr, Joe R. Lansdale, Casey Lansdale, Brian Smith, Hal Bodner, Kelly Lehman, and of course we also have the fullest house episode. Um, We have the Phoebe and Lombardo Book Club. We're closing in very soon on a milestone, episode 75. So there are lots of good things to come, folks. Um, In the meantime, if there's something you want to talk to us about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website, The Horror Show with BrianKeen.com. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms via Project iRadio. Visit them online at ProjectiRadio.com. If you have a moment, also consider contributing to their patron campaign. Uh, you can find that at patron.com slash Project iRadio. To advertise on The Horror Show, send an email to the horror show with Brian Keen at Outlook.com. We will get back to you. It may take us a few weeks at this point. As I said, I'm traveling. Dave is busy swimming around in his new basement swimming pool. <laughs> but uh, we will get back to you. As always, thank you for listening. Uh, we are, We are, in fact, coming up on uh, episode 75. and I really never thought we'd get to that, to be honest with you. Um, it's pretty cool. And it's pretty cool to be reaching so many of you and touching so many of you and helping you. Um, thank you for your emails and your comments on social media. Thank you for the support. Um, I know I complain on this show about the the few detractors that we have, but it's also not lost on me, but that the vast majority of, of you support what we're doing and you do so verbally. You don't just do it silently. You do it verbally. You let us know. And that means a lot. It really does. Um, so thank you for that. And I hope that you'll continue to listen. I hope we'll continue to, to entertain and inform. We'll see you next week. <laughs>